Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for dialing in to the Fidelity Future Leaders Fund update. I'm Felicity Rock, Regional Sales Manager out of Victoria and SA. Today, I'm joined by our Portfolio Manager, James Abella, and we also have the added bonus of Sam Heathersay and Brendan Mowry, um, two of our analysts joining in the conversation today. So welcome, James, Brendan, and Sam. To those on the line, uh, feel free to use the Q&A function throughout this update today. You can address any of the speakers um, with any of your questions and we hope that we'll get to cover them all up um, throughout today's session. I wanted to start today by acknowledging James's 10 year milestone of the fund. Congratulations, James. Thank you. Um, I know, James, it was one of your goals to achieve double digit returns for clients over that 10 years. And today we can sit here very proudly and say that you've achieved that. So yes. congratulations. Right. Yeah, thanks. For this. No worries. James, I might uh, kick off the conversation with you. Uh, the fund is open. We've got flows coming in. Can you talk us through how you're deploying your capital today? And given the increase in quality names in your fund over the last 18 months, your process does allow for this increase. Um, just talk us through sort of your current QM TV allocations and your focus on valuation disciplines. Yeah, thank you. Look, certainly the quality had a very difficult time. It was a big value rally last year, but quality has definitely returned and the dispersion in stock valuations has started to rise as the market has basically the duration has gone out. Uh, the market's gone from the recession sort of fees into soft landing. So today we have quality at 47%, uh, momentum at 21%. Um, and then transition and value is around 32%. So that's where we are today. The, the big movement has definitely been towards quality in the last, especially the last six months. Um, and that's something we'll likely continue uh, going through the reporting season and then adding to momentum very selectively. Very good. Did you want to talk through the next slides? Yeah, so yeah, um, I think Mel's got the slides there uh, in the background. So look, it's a very normal fund. We've won lots of awards in the past. Um, for me, it's still all about client returns. So if you go to the next slide, uh, that's really the focus for me is about returns. Where that dark blue dot is, is where the focus has been for me for the last decade. And as Felicity mentioned, I'm very proud that it's got the double digit where 1% above the index over inception but we've got less risk in the index. We've got 4% above small lords. Um, and uh, that's really great. And we've done that with less risk uh, than the small lords index. So that's a pretty great position. Also compared to large caps, we've got 2% more return with only 1.5% more risk. Um, and that's the real objective of the fund with all of the risk parameters, the VSC process and the QMTB process really focused on risk. Um, and volatility reduction for clients to deliver a smoother outcome and a better outcome for clients than the index. So that's where we are. So very proud of where that dark blue dot is today after 10 years. Uh, next slide. So this is just trying to give an overview of the market. As I mentioned, quality has had a big D rating, but the, the last, I guess, since the beginning of the year, that, that really started to recover. And the dispersion between quality and value and within sort of quality or growth or momentum names has really started to expand now. So particularly technology, healthcare and insurance has been in uh, sectors where they definitely had quite high dispersion and quite a big movement in valuation levels. That second point, momentum recovery. Uh, look, you've had a lot of stocks. So if I just give three examples, uh, Life360, Megaport, um, and one more, which just escapes me, but uh, Megaport, Life360, and SiteMind are actually the three that I had in mind. Those have been up you know, between 20 and 70% in the last few months or six months, um, just because the market's moved from fearful to being a bit more hopeful, and they've given basically certainty and, and growth and visibility of their earnings or cash flows in some instances. And that's meant they've, they've recovered quite well. Um, also just that value and transition, you gotta be very selective right now. Um, just move on to thematic, still structural growth is still very positive. Uh, the growth is still very scarce, certainty is very scarce. Uh, so if you can provide those two things, those structural growth stories are still expanding right now. Insurance is still a big theme. Tech recovery, if you look at the US NASDAQ, it's up over 20%. And then in Australia, lithium, electric vehicles, copper, nickel, which Sam will touch on, is still very, very topical right around the world. Um, macro is still uncertain, but as I mentioned, uh, with rates and also recession fears, they have 
receding in some way right around the world from England and the US and locally in Australia as well. Uh, housing in the US uh, is more positive. The China thesis is sort of soft landing is, has sort of played out and Sam will touch on that as well. Um, and definitely the markets have become more constructive with things like Megaport, MLI 360 up, you know, 40, 50, 60 percent in the last few months. You're seeing that only recently, um, and that's really where the market's headspace is at. And valuation discipline is still there. You've still got high inflation. You've still got high rates. So still think the valuation discipline is still important. Um, next slide. Um, this is, I won't try to go into too much detail, but try to move away from earnings into free cash flow yields. And you can just see small caps um, quite expensive now, still 4%, whereas mid caps are more attractive at sort of mid range of the free cash flow sort of range over the last 15 years. And the earnings growth, definitely mid caps, you can see much stronger in that bottom chart. Uh, the blue line, whereas small caps has been much flatter in aggregate. So when you're picking small caps, you need to pick quality stocks, growth stocks, structural winners, and those are the ones that you want to be picking out of the small cap universe. Next slide. And this is another one, a bit more details. So I'll just focus on the bottom charts there. So the rolling three-year return for small caps, as I've showed at the front end, is around 5%, which is quite a low level. Um, the ROE has, though, been in that range. And the ROE to, you said the total return is very, very correlated. One thing that I do focus on a lot. Um, but that orange line has started to lift up. So that's a big positive for small caps if they can deliver on that the return will, will follow um, for small caps in the next sort of six to 12 months. Whereas mid caps are still at that 9% level. Um, the ROE has been very stable and the return's been at that level as well for the last 10 to 15 years. And that's where you can see the quality of mid caps is definitely higher than in small caps. Uh, but that uplift in smalls is, is a little positive that you can see there. Um, I'll hand it over back to Felicity now. Thanks, James. And no, I appreciate that. And uh, it's great to see, obviously, the balanced approach within your portfolio playing out uh, through these sort of times. Sam, I might uh, bring you in and welcome you to the conversation today. For those on the line, Sam is our metals and mining analyst, has, is based out of Sydney, 11 years experience being an analyst, five of which are with Fidelity. Um, Sam, given uh, resources are such a focus for the Australian investor, and obviously China can play a bit of a role in that, can you talk us through your thoughts on the sector at the moment and where you're seeing opportunities? Sure, happy to, uh, Felicity. Um, so I guess to, to understand where we're going, it's important to probably know where we've been. And uh, and so I just focus on this slide on, on the China, on the Australian resources year-to-date performance. And the first thing you'd probably notice on the left-hand side is that uh, commodity performance has been negatively skewed. And the main driver of that is that the China reopening has been anything but smooth. The policy response that we've seen has, has been more stabilizing than, than stimulating so far. And China is only, it's 18% of, of the global population and 18% and of the global GDP, but it's more than 50% of demand for some of these commodities like copper, nickel, alumina, coal, it's almost 70% of demand for iron ore. And so it's a significant player and has an outsized uh, influence on commodity direction. Um, and and that's, that's what's driven the, the kind of negative skew in commodity prices you see on that left-hand chart. Um, we, uh, we saw last week um, hints of a stimulus uh, coming from the Chinese government, but again, it proved to be more stabilizing so far than stimulatory and iron ore has traded off um, from uh, from its highs there. Uh, and that's a pattern I expect to be repeated. And that's what we've really been seeing all year is, as, as poor economic data, particularly property, uh, has been has been met with greater hope of, of stimulus and, and that hasn't really been um, the case so far. So with that in mind, the, the stock dispersion that you see in that middle chart is actually quite wide and quite a few positives in there, um, which is not what you would expect considering the, the, the negative skew on commodities. So there's a few other themes at play that I highlight on the right-hand side. Um, we've obviously had the US recession fear spiral and rising rates uh, factor into a lot of commodities and, and a lot of the, you know, stock performance as well. Um, but I think it's important to call out some other themes that drive some stock performance here. Cost and capex inflation is certainly occurring at a micro level. And so some of the underperformers you see there are because they reported delays or higher capex numbers to their, some of their projects. But we also see increasing appeal of real assets and, uh, and particularly gold as an inflation hedge, which is why it's up there among some of the top performers 
uh, at a macro level. The other things to call out is we've had a lithium cycle uh, year to date. So we've had um, Albemarle uh, uh, launch a bid for Liontown. We've had um, Livevent uh, go after Alchem um, and, uh, and a few other names in there as well. Um, and that's driven a lot of the outsized outperformance you've seen in the lithium space in particular. And then the final point I would add there is we've seen increasing resource nationalism, um, which is what you typically see uh, when you know commodity prices are particularly strong. Um, rare earths uh, is, is a, a hot topic right now. We've seen a lot of government co-investment, non-recourse loans, critical mineral strategies that are focused on it. And that's driven a lot of um, idiosyncratic stock performance um, as well. But I guess overall, looking at, this, looking at these charts, I would expect um, copper, for instance, to be weaker than it has been. Uh, and it's held up for other reasons that are, that, are, that are less cyclical than we've seen historically. And if we move on to the next slide, I think that one of the key themes there is the structural growth story that we're seeing in global decarbonisation. China industrialization has ultimately fueled the mining boom in the early 2000s. But now as we look forward, we're, we're looking at a more mineral intensive global decarbonisation tailwind to take over. Uh, and there are many charts that point out the mineral intensity of global decarbonisation. This is just one of them presented by the um, International Ed Energy Agency. And essentially on the left hand side, it shows that in order to achieve what they call their sustainable development scenario, which is essentially Paris aligned goals, we will need four times growth in um, the minerals demand uh, to, to, to fulfill those needs. If you wanted to get to net zero by 2050, it'd be six times. Um, and if you look at the individual commodities that that entails, it would require a 42 times increase in lithium demand, graphite 25 times, copper is not listed on there, but that's 28 times um, what we saw in 2020. And the scale of that demand um, needs, can't be understated. I think that Rio uh, Tinto chairman probably phrased it best when he said that in order for us to meet the 2050 goals we have in mind for copper, we will need to mine the exact amount of copper that we have mined in all of human history again. So that's about 700 million tonnes. And it's when you put it in those terms that I think we begin to understand the scale of the challenge here. And that presents a number of opportunities as well as challenges to ASX miners and mid caps in particular. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll just discuss a few of those, those challenges um, and why they might present opportunities. The reason why we probably haven't met the, um, why we're unlikely to meet the demand profile that we outlined in the previous chart is there's, there are a number of factors. One of them is historic underinvestment. If you look on the left-hand chart there, that basically just shows the capex from some of the majors and the different commodities they've been investing in. And you'll see that we aren't quite back at the peaks that we saw in 2012 and 2013. Now, there are a number of explanations for that. Some of them may call it peak cycle uh, overcapitalization. Now we're focused more on cash returns. It might be the end of the commodity super cycle generated by China. But I think there are another, a number of other factors at play here. And, and one of them is what something we touched on in a decarbonisation paper we wrote which is essentially that, that um, global decarbonisation is a double-edged sword in that demand for minerals comes um, with concerns, increasing concerns around ESG. And as a result, we don't necessarily want the mines in our own backyard um, to fuel global decarbonisation. So it's becoming harder for these mines to be permitted. And, uh, and that's a particular problem. So you see there, the, the orange and the green parts of the chart highlight that the underinvestment in particular in battery metals and copper will mean that we're unlikely to meet the, the demand projections that we outlined on the previous chart. And, and that's, that creates a problem. The second point is that China has dominated the EV supply chain historically. Um, they don't mine it as much as we do. So for instance, lithium, you can see there and copper, uh, copper and nickel, um, we, we certainly have advantages. Uh, as, a, as in Australia, but we haven't built out the mineral processing capabilities or any of the further downstream capabilities to actually transform that raw ore into a usable battery or electric vehicle. Um, and, and so we will need to invest further downstream to ensure that there is greater security of supply to fuel this decarbonisation. And I think we've already started to see that, um, particularly from uh, Western nations with the US focusing on its Inflation Reduction Act, the EU Critical Minerals and Battery Act, 
Um, and I think we're likely to see more of that resource nationalism uh, take effect. Now, where can Australian miners fit in here? Well, if we outline the scale of the demand and the challenges that we face, I think Australia can certainly take centre stage and, and ASX miners in particular. Um, why? Because we have, a, we have the, the, the raw resource to begin with. We have a decent reputation uh, on ESG factors that will appeal to OEMs and those that want to sign on with us. Um, and so I think we can be uh, great beneficiaries of all these trends that I've outlined. And, and that's where I see are some of the opportunities uh, in future, and in particular, ASX mining mid caps. Fantastic. Thanks, Sam. That's brilliant. Um, I just might stay on uh, certain sectors. And Brendan, I might welcome you to the conversation today. For those online, uh, Brendan, seven years being an analyst, um, currently covering the consumer sector at Fidelity. However, previously, you've had experience in um, covering dedicated small mid cap exposure. So obviously it fits really well with um, today's conversation, Brendan, and the consumer is such a hot topic at the moment. They're under pressure. However, we've seen that consumers here in Australia aren't necessarily um, you know, completely uh, stopping their spending. What can you put that down to? And given um, this sector, can you see that there is opportunities actually available? Thank you very much for the introduction, Felicity. Um, yeah, look, I think at this juncture, it's pretty clear that uh, optimism is creeping back into the market. And I suppose that's on the back of this immaculate disinflation uh, narrative. So rates peaking, inflation coming down and not causing any sort of major economic ructions. Um, I think within the Australian context, there's, there's three probably significant drivers that I point out over the, you know, that are going to play a really important role over the next six months. I think, um, you know, the mortgage cliff, Everyone's already on top of that. Everyone's aware of that. But I think um, what is new is that as 40% of these fixed rate loans start to flip over into variable, we are actually now seeing the economic impact of that. Um, you know, and I think uh, ANZ provided some credit card data over the last month that showed year on year sales down, you know, within these discretionary items about 10% year on year, which is a really material pullback. Mm -hmm. um, you speak to any real estate agents, uh, listings and appraisals are starting to reaccelerate uh, at a pretty material rate, you know, investors coming back to market in what is, you know, seasonally quite a quiet period. Um, ANZ, the Roy Morgan, the Consumer Sentiment Index, they disaggregate consumer sentiment into, you know, different types of property owners and mortgage holders, are, you know, now their, their sentiment is plumbing sort of serious lows um, and arrears are starting to pick up. So I think it's, it's quite clear now that the, the impact of these interest rates is starting to have a significant impact on the health of the consumer and that's translating into data um, you know and we're more or less two months into that thematic and we've got quite a little bit of way to go um, I think as we push further into this year uh, you actually start to see the three-year stacks so you know like for like sales growth over that pandemic period actually start to accelerate and the peak will be in the third quarter of this calendar year for furniture, electronics, and, and probably most acutely uh, for, for clothing and accessories. So that's going to be an incremental headwind just as they come up against tougher comps, um, you know, and that's going to show up in the FY23 reporting trading updates. So potentially a little bit of sticker shock and some opportunities on the back of that. Um, you know, and I think the, the really critical point to make would be Employment has been, you know, the, the final bastion of, of this resilient consumer narrative, um, you know, and if you think about it just intuitively, when consumers are facing inflationary pressure and cost of living pressure, um, you know, they, they might reshuffle the budget, um, you know, trim back, trade down and, and, you know, change their budgets a little bit. But you don't get a wholesale sort of pullback on consumer spending or, you know, just capitulation until consumers feel like they're, you know, afraid of losing their jobs or until the unemployment rate starts to tick up. Now, one of the best leading indicators we have for that is capacity utilisation, which is effectively a measure of um, industrial output relative to what we can produce. And if you put that on a three month lag, the correlation is really significant for unemployment. Um, that reading has now rolled over and it sort of suggests that by the end of the year, we'll be having a 4% handle in front of uh, unemployment versus, you know, three and a half percent that we've got now. Um, that would be, you know, by historical standards, not particularly elevated. But when you think about the rate of change, um, you know, that would be a really significant headwind for, for consumers broadly. And, and for these stocks. So I think that that's something certainly to watch out for over the next um, you know, few months. If we can just shift to the next slide, please. 
Um, you know, a lot of the bulls will sort of talk to valuations, um, you know, and, and a lot of these headwinds are being already priced in and that sort of fuels into this optimistic sentiment that's starting to take hold. You know, I'd probably push back a little bit on that. Um, if you just look at that chart there, that looks at historic valuations. Um, when you look at it on a five-year average on a pre-pandemic basis for the consumer discretionary sector, um, and you can see there, if, if you adjust for this 0% rate environment, on the whole, valuations are actually quite expensive, um, you know, and, and if you're anchoring to that period, you know, over the 2020 and 2021, where interest rates were at 0%, for me, that's the wrong foundation, um, you know, we are in a different regime, rates are higher for longer. And you should really be looking at that pre-pandemic period as, as sort of your base. Um, and once you adjust for that, there's, there's some way to go before evaluations actually start to look attractive. If you think about just, you know, this environment as well, the combination of a return to promotion, which will put pressure on GP margins, um, you know, and some really significant inflationary pressure that they're seeing at the cost of doing business line. So wages, uh, insurance, rents, they're all going up. And against a backdrop of softening sales, um, that can be a really acute mix and, and lead to some pretty significant margin degradation. Um, you know, and we saw the early signs of that in June with some of the small caps starting to come out with some really significant downgrades, you know, a, a 5% cut in revenue sales growth year on year when you've got underlying inflation of sort of 5 to 6%, that can drive EPS downgrades of 25 to 30%, um, which is obviously really significant. That's going to be a headwind that we face, particularly in the first half of FY24 or the second half of this calendar year. If we can just move on to the next slide. Um, obviously, all, all that sounds pretty negative and, I, you know, it'd be remiss of me not to come up with some opportunities. And I think there are definitely pockets that are attractive. Um, if I think about the QSR space, and I'll probably narrow that down to the franchise operators, so your Collins Foods and your restaurant brands um, over in New Zealand, these guys were at the absolute epicenter of inflationary pressure. So in terms of, you know, wages skyrocketing, uh, food inflation skyrocketing, uh, you know, electricity, really significant inputs for these businesses, those are now starting to subside. Um, and as they were probably some of the biggest losers of inflation, they'll be some of the biggest winners of disinflation. Uh, you, you put into that the fact that they've got relatively stable demand drivers in terms of new store rollout, but also just um, you know, a fairly resilient demand profile in the sense that there is a bit of a flight to value in tougher economic times. Those guys seem like a relatively good place to be um, and valuations on a historic basis are relatively attractive. So QSR is a, is a really interesting space for me at the moment. And QSR, Brendan, is quick service quick restaurants? Quick service restaurants, yeah. yeah. So yeah. your Collins Foods, restaurant brands and, and to probably a lesser extent Domino's. Um, the other pocket which has been really resilient and has benefited predominantly from, I guess, a, a shift in mix for consumers away from goods and, and towards travel well services has been the travel sector so you know flight center webjet uh hello world which today has put up a you know a 10 percent upgrade to earnings um that remains resilient and i suppose there's still a lot of um you know capacity to come back online which will improve both affordability and just volumes generally um so there's a, there's a reasonable pathway for growth for those businesses. One thing that I would suggest is, you know, that's becoming quickly a consensus trade. There is a little bit of crowding. Um, so I think that whilst there's still an upgrade cycle in play, you're probably getting closer towards the end of that. And I suppose, you know, if, if things play out the way I anticipate, there might be a bit of switching into some of these beaten up retailers outside of, you know, the recent winners, which has been travel. Um, you know, and just from a valuation perspective, there are definitely pockets emerging of genuine value. Um, you know, in most sort of cyclical downturns, you get a bit of a flight to safety. A lot of money comes out of small caps. Um, those valuations now are looking quite attractive. A lot of those businesses already sort of taken their medicine. There was a lot of downgrades in June. Um, so there's a little bit of attraction there. And then, you know, you look there at the, the great man, Jerry Harvey, um, you know, that that's a lot of the valuation of that business is now underpinned by the physical assets that sit within Harvey Norman. So, you know, against what is a really challenging backdrop, there's certainly, you know, there is opportunities in consumer land. And I think, you know, more will emerge as we push further into this year. Fabulous. Thank you, Brendan. That's great. Appreciate that. And um, James, I might bring you back 
Uh, now, obviously, with the resources around us, the research team that we have, guys like Sam and Brendan, that's a pretty incredible backdrop um, to think and look through for opportunities. But obviously, there's different sectors and everything. So did you want to now spend some time on what the next 12 months or the outlook for the fund looks like? And obviously, if there's any sort of other opportunities out there in different sectors. Yeah, certainly. I'll work through these sort of next 10 slides and then and then we'll hand it over back to you for Q&A. Okay. Look, the thing now in the market, quality momentum is, is now coming back into the market. As I mentioned, quality, which is pretty much healthcare and technology and also those sort of consumer tech names have really been very strong, especially things like WiseTech. Um, Brendan, um, Brendan mentioned um, travel has been strong, which is more the momentum side, but the insurance side has been very strong in quality. Um, so pretty much tech, financials um, and healthcare strong in quality. And the momentum is really, Sam mentioned lithium. Lithium has been very strong. Gold actually been pretty good. Biotech's been good. And also then travel's been you know, quite strong in terms of momentum. So those two sectors still going quite well. Um, transition, Momentum in travel is debatable, as some people think it's already reached peak cycle. Um, that's still a debate. And when I went around Australia last week, you know, that definitely was a debate in terms of are we peak in terms of insurance and peak in terms of travel. Um, lithium, I'm not sure of the view that it's more structural, um, but they're the two topical ones in small caps right now. Definitely travel and insurance being very crowded, very, you know, have traded up really well. I've had significant earnings upgrades, but I've also had quite a lot of multiple expansion. Um, so there, there's definitely is a debate, is, is that in transition or momentum? Um, but that transition area is still uh, things like Collins Foods. The market's not really convinced. They came up with a good result. The stock did move. Um, but that is still, you know, still a bit of a debate in the market, but that is definitely looking good. And property as well, now that there's a view that inflation and rates have peaked, um, that, that also has now become of interest. And definitely value um, a bit less in terms of strength, but a couple of property names, a little bit of industrial names, and the, the petrol retailers are down there. So as I mentioned in the title, quality underway, momentum working in very fine pockets, uh, and transition and value very, very stock specific. Uh, let's move on to the next one. So this is, as I mentioned, now quality is pretty much near near maximum and will continue to be added towards maximum. Momentum is being added to, but very, very selectively and transition and value is sort of shrinking overall and where there is more strength, I'm going towards that as the market is more constructive um, at cash levels, you know, still quite low at, at two, three, four percent, but definitely uh, moving towards you know, typically quality and momentum, um, but transition value is still interesting. Next one. So this is the really overall strategy, as I mentioned, really strategic tilt towards structural quality. So half the portfolio is really that structural growth stories. So quality uh, in technology and healthcare, but then also the moment, more momentum thematics in lithium. Um, and then the current trends that are upgrading is really in insurance, uh, travel and financials. Um, and some consumer names. So very stock specific right now, dispersion has really started to expand um, in terms of valuation dispersion between winners and losers, which we'll touch on later. Um, but conviction is very high where you do have good market structures or you give good visibility right now. As I mentioned, things like Megaport, Live360 um, and, and SiteMinder, they've just given upgrades. Um, yesterday we had Baby Bunting give a just a top of top of guidance up creating the stock is up 20 percent so the people the market's moving from a fear of recession to things are okay and if the market just moves that little bit it's it's 20 percent movement um but if you can give visibility if you can give confidence and that's what happens in this market the duration of the investor's mindset starts to drift out and that's what allows those multiples to expand so you can start to see that happening um i'll just go to the next slide now keep moving through this is really trying to give you the numbers of the portfolio structure. And you can see here that the ROE is 14 of the fund versus the index at around 11. Uh, the growth rate is 17 versus 11. And the estimated three-year growth is 14 versus that 10 and a half. So we're definitely quality skewed, definitely growth skewed. Um, but where you see the ROE 14 versus 11 as well, um, there's definitely an attraction towards high quality businesses and high growth businesses, but we're not trying to, you know, significantly overpay for them. We'd go back to the first line, 
the P is 22 versus 14.7 for the for the index. So we're not trying to be valuation agnostic. We don't want to be buying growth at any price or momentum at any price. We want to be owning growth and owning quality, but where there is a good valuation discipline and those value names still, we want them to have growth and also strong balance sheets uh, and, and a decent outlook, not just buying purely on valuation, but also not being valuation agnostic. Um, next slide. So this is, I'll talk through performance. So the performance was pretty tough, I guess, last year was quite tough. We're now recovering quite strongly as the market's moving towards quality momentum, but also the underweights in value um, and also the underweights in other names that are really not working is now starting to add value as well. So you can see just relative to my index, which has been quite strong over six months, um, the fund is up 4% um, and the one year has now has now turned positive. Um, and the next one, small caps, you can see an even bigger jump relative. Um, small caps, um, we're up, Felicity, sorry, the next slide, small caps are up 6% relative uh, on a six month basis. So the mark, market really hasn't moved. As I mentioned, that small cap earnings have, hasn't moved yet. Um, and the market really hasn't bounced in the last sort of six months, whereas mid caps have started to move upwards. So therefore that fund up 7%, it's up nearly 6% relative on the last six month basis, which is a pretty significant recovery. Uh, but what we would like to see as the market starts to move away from, from fear to kind of um, soft landing thesis. And we expect that, you know, for me, I expect that to continue as long as the earnings are there. Um, next slide, Felicity. Um, so this is the attribution you can see here. Um, Sam's uh, area has been quite a big contributor, especially on the stock picking, has been the biggest 4.6% contribution from stock picking. Um, the sector allocation has been more neutral because we've been pretty much neutral, but that's a pretty big contribution from there. Also technology, that recovery from things like WiseTech and Altium um, has been quite positive and also Megaport. And then financials, which has really been insurance, um, particularly, and not owning the banks, which have not been great. Um, and then it's really a small selection of others um, has really delivered, you know, more positive responses for the last 12 months. But it's come from those areas that I mentioned, pretty much quality and momentum is really where the attribution has been dr driving uh, the performance of the fund forward. Next slide. This is the top 10 here. You can see a mix of, again, pretty much quality and stocks where there is good earnings growth at the moment. So um, technology is there, resources are there, financials are there, um, and then also travel is there with Auckland. So um, you can see a good mix for uh, for me in terms of mainly quality and those that are giving short-term growth or, or getting a growth spurt uh, through momentum, which is really insurance. Um, but it's a pretty good blend. The, the average there, bet sizes are pretty normal for those who've known the fund for the last 10 years. Um, but yeah, a pretty good mix, uh, but mainly quality and momentum names really in that in that top 10 uh, of the fund at the moment. Thank you, Felicity. Next slide. So here you can see, again, resources is, is a very big chunk. I did a podcast with Sam a few months ago and mentioned that that, that 23 number just touched 30 for a very short period. And for mid and small caps to be 30% resources has only happened twice in the last 15 years. So it is a very um, telling um, fact about the, the structure of the index right now. And that is a lot of lithium, copper and nickel. Um, that's that's really significant. And we've been participating in them. And Sam and I wrote uh, a decarbonisation paper um, a number of months ago. So that also has been a theme that has been playing out and been aware of it with Infidelity for the last two or three years. So we've made good money out of, out of those um, thematics, earnings growth and reality of the structural growth that is happening uh, in that marketplace within resources. The next one down is really tech. As I mentioned, um, we've been a long-term holder in technology and a believer in technology, um, particularly software as a service, mainly through WiseTech at Altium. Um, then you've got um, other, a little bit of uh, consumer uh, there, which is very selective. And then next is probably healthcare worth a mention. So things like Prometicus and Fisher and Paykel have been long-term holds. Um, and they've been added to in the last little while as quality and the strength of those businesses really start to shine and also the strength of those businesses and the certainty of that growth starting to deliver, deliver performance as the multiples for those stocks begin to expand once again. Um, so pretty much those resources, um, IT, healthcare, then consumer, and then you've got other things like financials is also quite big, but as I mentioned, that's mainly through the insurance space. A little bit of real estate to keep a balance and to keep some yield still quite cheap there. 
um, but they do give good yields, four, five, six percent yields. Um, and then um, towards the side there, we've got a couple of industrials and at the moment, no energy, uh, no, no utilities. And that's where we are at the moment. Thanks. We've I've just had a question come through just on the financial side. Obviously, you've addressed that you're more positive on the insurance within that sector. We've just got a question asking specifically on judo. Do you have any, any thoughts around judo? Judo I don't own and haven't owned. So um, I've had a look at that, but just, yeah, don't feel comfortable with with those those smaller financials um have a lot of issues that i tend to just stay away from so um i don't own that one actually yeah, thank you. uh we can keep keep moving through sorry yeah, i didn't see yeah. um next slide mel please oh that's it that's it for the <laughs> webinar <laughs> yeah we're on, we've got this back different back but no thank you james that's that's wonderful. And thank you for your questions that have come through online. Um, I will just uh, go back to you, James, just on that, uh, your performance. So short term, we've been a lot stronger. Did you want to just make any clear observations across the last 10 years and obviously maybe the last five years on, on performance of the fund? Yeah, maybe we can just go back to the top 10 and, and hold it there. Um, look, certainly the last five years has been pretty challenging. Uh, we've had a big, you know, obviously COVID, we did really well. And on the way down, we outperformed by about 500 basis points. Um, but when money became free and there was a huge junk rally, quality lagged um, because momentum really led the market. And Afterpay was a huge negative drag on the performance. And that went from, from almost $10 to, to 10 times that amount. Um, that was a huge drag on the fund, uh, which really hurt a lot um, about three years ago. Um the last, and then pretty much after that huge momentum rally, you had quality really coming back into the market because rates started to rise and, and all of that sort of started to occur. And then you had the value rally just more recently in 2022. Um, now you've had really moved back to more normal markets. So high inflation, high cost of capital, hurdle rates are up here, not, not down here, where you could jump over, over a puddle, they were saying, um, during COVID. So anyone can jump over a puddle. Um, but now you need uh, the corporate maturity, you need visibility and earnings, you need earnings growth. Um, and that's where quality names are doing quite well. And momentum names are doing much better this year than they were last year uh, because the market's got a bit more duration, as I mentioned. So the market's happy to look out a year or two, whereas when the market goes from, from sort of greed to fear, fear is a very short duration mindset for an investor. So you move to valuation, you move to dividend yields, and you move to low PEs, and anything that's long duration assets tend to get hurt quite badly. And that happened at the same time inflation was high and rates were going up. Yeah. And now that you're moving into the opposite side, which is not, not greed, but we're suddenly moving away from fear into the middle sort of mindset. Um, you're moving uh, a longer duration, happy to pay up for high multiples or growth businesses in, in long duration. Um, and then if companies are delivering earnings and you can see them and you can see a year or two out that they're quite strong, the market's happy to, to, to start to pay up for those as well. So the market definitely has shifted from fear and greed. Um, one of the lessons, I guess, over 10 years is the market presents opportunities all the time. I, you, you just need to be aware of what market environment you're in. Um, and that, I guess, tells you what the risk, where the risks are but also where the opportunities are. And that's, I guess, where you need to move, uh, be aware of the market and move with the market, but then also have the patience uh, to accept that the market will be wrong for a short time, uh, which means you'll be wrong uh, for a short time. Um, and long in the long run, it is fundamentals and earnings um, and, and cash flows. And that's what will really drive stocks in the long run. But in the short term, there's a lot of emotion, there's fear and greed, there's all sort of different things that happen with inflation, macro shocks, um, pandemics that we've learned. Um, and these things change the market dynamic uh, in the short term. But in the long run, ultimately, it's earnings, cash flows and market structures that really drive uh, what, what stocks or businesses are worth uh, in the long run. No, well answered. Thank you, James. And I think I've frozen. So if I'm frozen on everyone's screen, I do apologize for that. Um, James, uh, we do have a healthcare sector question. Obviously, you've got ProMedicus there in your top 10. Um, but just wondering, is there any potential for another um, Australian healthcare company coming out of small big cap world? Um, and your thoughts on Telex 
say? Um, Telex, I won't say too much. I, I've looked at it and I don't have a big position, so I don't have a huge amount of um, knowledge on Telex. I do an NEU, which is Neuron, um, which is another one. So I do on that in the sort of middle, the top, top 20. Um, but yeah, mainly PME and Fisher and Pike will be my long-term holds. Uh, but healthcare, I would say, will be rising going through reporting season as these companies deliver earnings. Um, like Telex was a bit more positive and um, NEU was a bit more positive um, as these announcements happen and companies move from loss making to having contracts or licenses and cash flows, the valuations on that can turn quite dramatically. Um, and we've seen PME, you know, go up 10, 20 times over years and Fisher and Paykel as well. Um, so healthcare for me, a huge amount of interest. Um, and I probably will be moving in towards that sector. Definitely Telex is one on my radar screen, um, but probably don't want to say too much at the moment, but NEU I have bought um, already um, and that's already in the fund and, and is, you know, has been doing quite well. Thank you, James. And I apologize, my video has just fallen off. Um, but given the time, guys, I might actually uh, stop stop now and just thank everybody for dialing in. For those on the call, you will receive a survey that pops up on your screen. Please fill that out. You'll receive CPD points post, post that. But to James, uh, Sam and Brendan, it's been wonderful. Thank you very much for your conversation, your thoughts today. And anybody on the line, if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to contact your um, your contact at Fidelity and thank you all for attending. Thanks guys. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. You.